Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is Wikipediatrician Susan Gerbic. Susan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Got my first vaccine shot yesterday. Oh, congratulations. I have a brief bio on you, which I will read so people know who you are and what you do. And then I have several questions for you, if you don't mind. Affectionately called the Wikipediatrician, Susan Gerbic is the co-founder of Monterey County Skeptics and a self-proclaimed skeptical junkie. You are also founder of the Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia Project, and you are a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. You are the author of the Skeptical Inquirer column, Guerrilla Skepticism, and you have organized multiple undercover psychic medium stings, one of which was the subject of a feature article in the New York Times. You are also a snake handler, a three-time Olympic gold medalist in track and field, and you know all of that's true because it is on your Wikipedia page, so it has to be true. <laughs> is that correct? Well, if it says it on Wikipedia, it must be real. So we will talk about Wikipedia perhaps in a minute, but I wanted to start with the psychic sting and also how the pandemic has affected that with Zoom and where the mediums have moved their operations, so to speak. But it was just over two years ago, pre-pandemic, that your article came out in the New York Times. It was called Inside the Secret Sting to Expose Celebrity Psychics. Um, and it was a story about you going undercover. So can you define what you mean by celebrity psychic and what they do? Right. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of psychics and psychic mediums. Mediums are people who claim that they can communicate with the dead, whereas a psychic may be a medium, but they're also a psychic would, could be somebody who is reading tarot or your palm or whatever, and they don't necessarily claim to be able to communicate with the dead. They're more of a you know, read your mind or predict the future kind of thing. But the celebrity psychics that I tend to associate, you know, try to work on are more those that are have enough notability that they would have a Wikipedia page. So they are at a certain standard, like they have a TV show um, that they have multiple um, articles written about them in, in, in places like a reliable source, such as Skeptical Inquirer magazine, or maybe the New York Times, or Washington Post, or something like that. So the average run-of-the-mill psychic that's working at the down the street on the corner is not usually notable enough for me to work, to do an investigation on, not normally. So celebrity psychics, I would say somebody who probably has a TV show, not a book, because almost all, all these psychics seem to have a book out and they're not notable books at all. They're just whatever, you know, reminiscences of things I've had dreamed about that they claim are uh, from, the, from the other side, whatever that could mean. And you have also, have you coined the phrase grief vampire specifically? That's for Mark me? Edward. Mark, Mark Edward Ed coined the phrase um, grief vampire. We're trying to make it popular. So everybody watching this, make sure you use it somewhere today. And <laughs> Specifically, that relates to mediums and people that claim they can communicate with the dead, your long lost relatives. Why did that term grief vampire come into being? Is there a story behind well, I think that? it fits, don't you think? I mean, grief vampire fits because these are people who tend to prey. And I mean that not in the word prey as in the religious sense, but prey on people because what they're trying to do is get a hook in you. They're trying to get some sort of uh, way of taking more of your money, uh, investing more of your time. And um, in the case of people who have been abducted or are missing and the uh, psychic is a detective, you know, a detective supposedly working for the police, um, what they're doing is they may not be trying to get money, but they're trying to latch onto the fame. And, you know, if you make enough calls out there saying where the body might be found and then the body is found in a location that could plausibly be linked to whatever the psychic medium said, then the uh, psychic will be able to have fame because they'll be able to go onto the news and, and, and say, I found the body. I told you it'd be near uh, a, a highway or woods. Entrance, you know, or woods or whatever. Water. And, well, yeah. But I mean, they could get, they could get lucky. I mean, if you just say, I'm seeing the number 97, I mean, that could be just a guess. And maybe there is a house that is nearby that is, you know, 97 or, or Route 97 or 97 was part of the license plate or I, I don't know. You throw enough stuff at the wall, something's going to stick. 
Let's talk about your investigation. So when we're talking about these undercover sting operations, how do you do those investigations? Well, you know, I like to use social media because I guess my expertise is in hot reading. And I anticipate you're going to ask me, what is hot reading? Hot reading is whenever a psychic knows something about you ahead of time, usually doing some kind of research on you, most typically looking at your social media. But it could be as much, uh, even as simple as um, the psychic was, you were recommended to go to the psychic because your sister-in-law goes to that psychic. And so the psychic could say, hey, your sister-in-law is coming to see me, you know, tell me something about her. Well, that's hot reading if you tell the psychic something about them. Um, seeing a psychic more than once, that's considered hot reading because um, once the you've had a sitting with a uh, one of these so-called psychics, I think I should start calling them so-called psychics because we've never proved any of them to be real. So once you're sitting down with the, one of these people and this uh, so-called psychic is sitting here talking about your your, your life and gets a little bit of information from you, you know, starts to understand that your parents have died and that maybe you're retired and maybe your sister's having problems or whatever. And then the next time they see that same psychic, they will be able to just, you know, maybe this, maybe this so-called psychic took some kind of notes or something. And then the next time they, they, they are able to get more information because they'll be able to say, well, something about your sister, um, struggling with, um, some marriage problems, and you'd be like, yeah, that's right. Well, it's the same thing they told you last time, so that's hot reading also. Talk to me specifically about one of your investigations, the upfront work and then how you go undercover and what you find out. Well, we've done several. All of them have very unusual names. Um, the first one we did was Operation Bumblebee with uh, Chip Coffee, and that was a, a live show that uh, this this. Um, well-known psychic of sorts, uh, Chip Coffey was doing these shows, one in LA, one in uh, San Jose, which is nearer to where I live in California. And he had been doing these shows all over across the country. Different people in the skeptic community were attending the shows, surreptitiously recording the shows, and then going back and, and listening to it and seeing that it looks like he used a mix of hot reading and cold reading. Uh, the people who tended to be in the front rows of the psychic event were usually people he had read multiple times. He knew them on a first name basis. Um, they A lot of them attended the show over and over and over again. The first one I did with uh, Chip Coffee, we were trying to catch a hot read. It, it kind of was... Um, it was, it was more an investigation into how he did his thing and not so much. We caught him on anything. I mean, we did, but we didn't get it on audio. Tell me about what was the, what was the, um, operation pizza roll? That one you actually well, went pizza roll is the one that I'm more famous for. Yeah. Um, well, talk so me through that, the, the setup and <laughs> how you were careful to make sure that your T's were crossed and your eyes were dotted. So, right. to speak. so anybody who's listening to this, you probably should go and look at all of them. I, you know, I think so because they build one on the other. Cause as you go through one of them, you realize what you did, right. What you did wrong. And then you move on to the next and try to correct those things and, and building the team that's working on this, you have them and, you know, help and, and you learn from it as you go. So with operation pizza roll, I was, um, Mark Edward had said that if we could catch a psychic in a hot read, then the New York Times wants to write a, an article about it. So I said, okay, hot read it is. So one of my friends suggested this psychic that was going to be appearing in Hollywood about the time I was going to be in the area because I don't live near L.A. So uh, we said, okay, let's try that. So it took us about 10 days to put together uh, Facebook pages. Now we have Facebook pages, lots of Facebook pages that we've had that have existed for years. We've used them for multiple different investigations. We just change the names, change the photographs, hide or delete posts on it and create them to make them look like a character. And then our team, and I have multiple people who play on this team all over the world, they keep the Facebook pages looking realistic you know, posting pictures of their dog, posting pictures of, uh, you know, flowers in the garden or whatever. And, and, and they interact with each other. So they look indistinguishable, indistinguishable between, you know, uh, a real Facebook page and something that is, 
not a real person. So we changed these Facebook pages to reflect two people who were going to attend this event in Hollywood or LA, in LA. And that was Mark Edward and myself. So we changed them, they changed the names to be Susanna uh, Wilson and Susanna Forsyth Wilson, that was my name, and then Mark Wilson. And uh, the, the team, they called themselves the Pizza Rollers because it was Operation Pizza Roll. They created a scenario, a story of sorts that would be told within the Facebook pages of Susanna and Mark Wilson. And there was all sorts of other characters as well who were commenting, you know, people who were family members, people we'd gone to college with. Now, Mark and I had no access to these Facebook pages. We didn't know what the story was that was being told on them. We didn't know really what was happening on the pages. We had no access to them. We didn't know what the URL was. We didn't really even know what our names were going to be. Then we purchased tickets to attend the event. And using, when I say we purchased the tickets, um, you know, we had to be careful to um, not uh, use any identification. But I got sloppy. And one of the things I did is I did buy a ticket through, uh, I think it was Ticketmaster, using my real name. So the account was under Susan Gerbic. Um, that'll be important in a minute. So we went through um, and Mark and I attended the event. We go to the event, you know, you pick up your phone and you tell the pizza rollers, I'm, we're here, we're in the event. Maybe take a picture or two of the event and then send that picture and that text to the people who are in the pizza roll who are running the group, who are running this fake Facebook pages. Now, Mark and I were told very minimal things. He was told that his father had died years ago and that Mark had, um, his father died of heart conditions and that now Mark is about the age his father was when he died. So Mark's starting to have all these thoughts about, you know, possibly I'm gonna die of heart conditions. I'm gonna need to get some heart tests. So that was what Mark was told. And I think he was told there wasn't a great relationship between him and his father. I was told I had a twin brother named Andy who had died of pancreatic cancer uh, just very recently in the last couple of years. I do not have a twin brother. I do not have a brother who died. I do not have a brother named Andy. I do not have anybody in my family who's died of pancreatic cancer. So, and same thing with Mark. He didn't have a the father died years ago of heart condition. So when we show up, we sit down in the audience as close as we can be. We have VIP tickets, $161, I think, a person, so that we can be in the front, so we can have a meet and greet with the psychic afterwards. And this and this person's name is Thomas John. And it's all documented and, and the audio is all up on my website if anybody's interested. So what happens is that as we're sitting there, we're waiting for we don't know what, because I don't know how this psychic operates. I don't know if he's a hot reader. I don't know if he's cold reading. I don't know if he's going to ignore us. I don't know what's going to happen because we really hadn't done that much research in him. We'd just come along to see how, see how he was doing his thing and just really threw it together in, in 10 days. Whereas a lot of the other events, I mean, with the Operation Bumblebee, we spent six months working on those Facebook pages and trying to create um a backstory and trying to uh, infiltrate. So in pizza roll, uh, one of the things that happened was a woman sitting across from us uh, got a very accurate reading. I mean, detailed. And as Mark was closer to her, he could see that she, she was agreeing to everything and crying, but she wasn't really crying. She was dabbing at her eyes like, but she wasn't really crying. Mark could see that. She was she was wearing this green outfit. So we assumed we just kept calling her the lady in green. And Mark was like nudging me like, she's not crying. That woman, there's something going on. And we're like, oh, okay. And then right after her, then it was um, the psychic on the stage, Thomas John. He said, I'm getting a brother who went to reach out to his twin sister. And that's my cue. Okay, I know that much. So I raised my hand. Now, let me ask you a question. Go. Did anybody mm -hmm. else in the audience raise their hand as well? Or did or did you bother? Well, we were them? sitting in the front, as far okay. as I know, no. Okay. They said later that it was supposed to be for the person sitting behind me, but that was a bunch of hooey. I raised my hand. They came along with a microphone. Um, I had Kleenex in my in my pocket, you know, to dab at my eyes if I needed to. 
you know, because it's, it's so sad. So really what I was doing is just waiting to see what the psychic said. And he repeated again, you know, that I'm getting a brother named Andy who died something in the stomach area. I think it's cancer. And it was like, yeah. And I'm again, pretending to cry and being very emotional. And that's about all I know. Right. So, oh, I knew he died recently. So that's the only so then, information you had on your own. Pretty much, yeah, because I because I didn't I I needed to know enough to raise my hand. That's all I needed to know. Then he went on to tell us other things, and he he got Mark too. He said, "Oh, and and you know your your father, you know, you had distance between you two. Um, that um, you know you're having tests done. You're really worried about your heart." And so he got Mark too, exactly what Mark knew. But then he continued to read us for another fourteen minutes or so. Wow giving us information that we didn't know anything about something about a person named Maria, something about a jewelry box, uh, Michigan, somebody who smoked um, a dog or somebody named buddy, somebody named Steve. We didn't know what that was all about. So we just had to go, Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, of course. It just be as general as possible. And again, pretending to cry because of, you know, we don't know now the the, the medium, Thomas John, of course, is probably pretty suspicious because we're not acting probably like how other people would be. But I thought we did a damn good job and it didn't really matter because we already caught him. <laughs> I mean, the moment he started saying twin brother who died of pancreatic cancer and, um, you know, recently and his name is Andy, we know we caught him. We just don't know how well we caught him. Okay. The so rest of it was bait. So mm -hmm. the, the information he was giving you that you just had to play along with, what's the significance of that information? Well, we had to play along with it because we, we needed blind what was happening. We were blinded. For, it was like a double blind. Because when we sat in that room with this, this so-called psychic, Thomas John, and he's talking about somebody who quit smoking, Michigan, a dog named Buddy, Mark's dad was named Steve. We didn't know that. When he's relaying all that information, the only person who knows that information is the so-called psychic and the people who created the Facebook pages because everything he was saying matched the Facebook pages. And we have screenshots of all those Facebook pages with all those details on it. So there was no way he could have gotten it from our brains because we didn't know it. Your twin brother, Andy, pancreatic cancer, and your name and died recently, that's stuff that you knew mm -hmm. going in. And then mm -hmm. he continued to give you very specific information that you didn't know, but that was actually on Facebook, so you could go back and compare the notes. So Absolutely. the reason you didn't know it was because, so you couldn't be somehow giving him psychic vibrations, um, or whatever they call them. Yeah, whatever. But, whatever but he was, it was use, yeah. But it was obvious that he had to get those from someplace because they were very specific to what your persona was. Even he though didn't you didn't get know him from it. Us. He didn't get them from us. And we knew that he had seen the Facebook pages because a um, person on the team of the pizza rollers had written to him at one point saying, um, you know, like over uh, Facebook Messenger and said, we're, you know, I'm planning on attending my, you know, your event on this day. We really, uh, I really want to be in contact with my brother Andy. Do you think you could help me? something like that. And I believe he responded. So that means he had access to the Facebook page and he also knew what day we were going to attend. So he knew. Plus, whenever they posted on the Facebook pages, um, the pizza rollers would tag the Thomas John event. They would say, uh, I guess they were telling a story. I think my character was having dreams about my, my dead brother that doesn't exist. And saying that I was, you know, having a lot of dreams about him. And somebody said, well, why don't you go see a psychic? There's this guy that's going to be, you know, not too far from where you live or whatever, and tagged him so that he could, you know, if he follows his tags on Facebook, he would know that there's somebody tagging him and then tagged him again to give him another oomph to come look at the Facebook page. And so um he's the one who had access to the Facebook page. The people who created the Facebook pages, no one was within 300 miles of that venue. I mean, one was, one was in New Zealand, one was in uh, Australia. 
So I couldn't have known. And this was for a live show. It wasn't for a TV show recording. No, it was so, a live show. So let's see. I can sum this up. So you had a fake Facebook persona. You got tickets to an event. You tagged yourself or made it publicly known that you were going to be at the event. I didn't. You didn't. Someone My else did. My character did. did, yeah. Your character did. Um, the tickets are known because, of course, you get them through Ticketmaster, so some production manager knows who's going to be there. And then you were told information that was only on the persona's Facebook page, and very specific information at that. Mm -hmm. So you feel that's a pretty good catch of a hot read. I can't imagine it being any better. There, there's no way. And then after the fact, um, a day or so afterwards, I, I hardly ever tweet. Well, I'm not much of a tweet person. More now, but since the pan pandemic, but not so much at the time. And I received a m tweet from Thomas John and it came to the Susan Gerbeck Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter account. And all there was is a little heart, a red heart. And the only way he could have known that connected Susan Gerbeck with, um, Susanna, uh, Forsyth Wilson, who attended the event was if he looked at the Ticketmaster um, link that I bought the ticket through there. I, I, I made a mistake and in my hurry, I purchased a ticket from Ticketmaster or it was, it might not have been Ticketmaster. It was one of those account like things, you know what I'm talking about? And, and he would have looked and seen that the ticket was purchased and that was the name of the person. He might've been curious and said, well, that was odd. That couple was really odd. Let me do some more research and found that that I was actually Susan Gerbeck, who I'm a person he would not have heard of before. I'd never heard of him before. Well, you're saying it's a mistake, but actually it's kind of a fortuitous mistake because it's, yeah, it's it actually well. <laughs> more confirmation of what he mm -hmm. kind of was like nudging you or like winking at you or I don't know what you would say. Yeah, he, he knew that I, he connected it. But and that was in the a very way, next, that was great. But mm -hmm. that was the very next day, right? So, or the or, next day or, the, or within a day or two. Yeah, so you so hadn't written about it yet. So I'm, it's interesting. You hadn't written about yeah, it yet, no, so he's no. not responding to anything that you had done. Um, he did go on from there, because I think most people may have heard of Thomas John by now, because he had this show, Seatbelt Psychic. And you stung him. <laughs> I'm sure he can still deny that whatever happened with you was just a fluke or something. But the, the TV show, Seatbelt Psychic, I mean, he's picking up strangers on the street. And I mean, a lot of people could say, how can that possibly be faked? Oh my gosh, it is so obvious now. I mean... <laughs> so wait a minute, so when you say that it's obvious, you've actually done work on looking into that as well. So if, if that's the case, how, you say it's obvious. Why is it obvious? Well, you have to remember this is TV, right? So um, nobody's getting into the backseat of a car that is being filmed without having cameras all over them. Right. You can see from the show Seatbelt Psychic, there are multiple camera angles right on the person's face, from the dashboard, from the driver's side window as they walk up to the car. So if there are multiple camera angles on that car as they sit in the back seat, there's no way that a person's going to sit in that car and not go, what's all these cameras? I'm getting out of here. You know, it's not like they they were obviously prepped that there would be cameras in the car unless they were really tiny. You know, that's possible, I guess. And then when they get in the car, they sit down, they put their seatbelt on, and then they drive away from the curb and they go and Thomas John says, hi, you know, how's your day? And they're like, fine. And then he says, I'm a medium and I talk to the dead and your father got in the car with you. Are you okay with me doing a reading for you? And they're like, yeah, okay. You know, and it's, it's filmed from the leaving of the curb to the, it's, it's all filmed. You can see it, but at no time does he get a direction from them. Where are we headed? He doesn't put anything into some kind of little, you know, he's supposed to be acting like an Uber, you know, like a, a ride share of some sort, but why does he not confirm where he's taking him? Why, why isn't he putting any, anything in a little, you know, directions or anything? There's nothing. And then when people get into the car, if there's two people that get in the car, they always sit in the exact same way. Somebody gets into the car and sits in the middle seat of the back seat, and the other one sits at the, at the other side. And it's so the camera can see them because the person who would be sitting in the other side, there's not a good camera angle on that. So you're so saying these they two scrunched. People are scrunched up together in the back seat. Oh, Why? so they're scrunched together to get the camera. I gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't make sense. And they always, nobody has like, 
you know, bags with him. You know, he's not picking him up. It looks like at an airport or, or taking him into an airport or, you know, it doesn't look like he goes and puts the baggage in the, you know, luggage in the trunk or they, they didn't come from shopping. It doesn't look, it doesn't look right. It, it looks finished. The people are, nobody's wearing logos. Nobody has like a baseball hat on. Everybody looks put together just right. Like the hair is just right. Like they know they're going to be on camera. Well, let me, let, you got to explain that for a second because, you know, you're coming from a background of information of TV. Now, and you say they don't have logos, they don't have baseball hats on. People could say, yeah, so what? I don't wear logos. But there's, what, what's, what would the rationale be between not wearing a logo or? When, when you're working in the TV business and you're like an extra, an actor, somebody who's, who's uh, going to be on a show, they can't wear logos. They can't wear any of that because it'd have to be blurred out or it'd have to have, you know, permission from the licensing department of Nike or whatever, I guess. You just can't show up and expect to be filmed. Um, I remember, I don't know if you remember the TV show that was on forever, Price is Right. And um, that was really popular. If you showed up to go to Price is Right and probably thousands of people did over the years, you knew that you can't go on to, the, you will not be called to the stage if you have any kind of logo or anything on you. You have to be uh, wearing like as you are, you know, some kind of neutral color, neutral clothing, no um, baseball team names or football team names or funny slogans or anything like that. You have to wear, um, this is, how, it's known in the industry that you have to wear, um, you know, clothing that would be something that they're not going to have to take the logo out with. So it's good that you mentioned that, though, because you, you're you in California, you know, L.A., Hollywood, around that area. <laughs> well, but No, I'm a long ways from there. Well, no, but what I mean is you're familiar with the, 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 the work that gets done there, whereas I'm way on the East Coast. I would never know, really, that oh, I really? couldn't show up with okay. a Nike shirt on or something like that. Although I have noticed recently that they uh, some of these game show participants seem to be really well put together. Perhaps Especially if fact. it's, yeah, it makes you really think about it. If it's an impromptu, like if a, if a camera is coming into a shop to ask a bunch of people, a bunch of questions about, you know, how they're going to vote or whatever, you will see people at, in normal attire, which a lot of the times includes logos and baseball right. and, and sports teams. A random stuff. sampling But of if people. you go in yeah. and it, yeah, it's a just random sampling. That's normal. They're wearing polit politician things and, but if you were to go into something and you don't see any of that and the people just look a little put together, you know, their nails are done, their hair looks good. Um, they don't look like the average person you just would meet on the street. Well, then you have to stop and think, was this planned beforehand? Because they also have to sign something. You're not going to be in a car, in a car with, with a stranger with cameras on you and you haven't signed something first. Well, let me ask you a question. Come you think, on. You think there's any chance they're instant stooges? They're walking down the street. There's a producer there wearing his headset and a camera crew. And they say, no. hey, you want to be on a TV show? And No. No. Because I found one of the people who, who, at least one of the people, I've known, actually, I found several people. But one talked to me, and he explained to me what happened. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's and reiterate. That before you, hold on. Before you go through that too much, say that again slower. You actually tracked down someone that was on seatbelts psychic. Go through that just a little slower. Okay. So I was put in contact with somebody who was on seatbelt psychic. And I don't really want to say how I found this person because I don't want to reveal who this person is. That's fine. Because That's there's fine. a limited amount of people in the show. But I had a long conversation with this person. I don't even want to say the gender, male or female. Fine. So um through conversations with this person, I think I call the person Pat because Pat is, you know. Um, so talking to Pat, Pat explained that they saw an ad, you know, Pat wants to be on TV, likes that, you know, idea of being famous someday. And Pat, I guess, responded to an ad on like Craigslist or one of those TV in Hollywood, I guess they put out these releases saying, you know, we're looking for extras for this or we're looking for people to be on a game show. So Pat responded to something saying, you know, would you like to be on a game show? And Pat filled out an application online. Um, then after a while, Pat was given an uh, uh, email to show up on a certain day. And of course, with the clothing to be worn a certain way, certain kind of clothing and then they showed up at a location and 
uh, filled out more forms. Pat says they didn't even know what they filled, signed. They just signed a bunch of forms and they said the car will be coming in a few minutes. And Pat noticed that it was like all set up for the day and it was every hour somebody would, would show up and uh, the next person would come along, that kind of thing. So it was hourly. Pat goes out to the curb because Pat was told there's the car's coming for you. And Pat goes and sees all these cameras all over the car and gets into the back seat of the car and thought, Pat thought that they were going to go to like a talk show, like a Sally, Jesse, Raphael kind of thing, you know, like a some kind of talk show or game show, didn't know what was going on. And then the psychic starts talking, Thomas John starts talking about talking to Pat's dead family members and they drove for an hour and Pat said that they you know, were crying and they weren't paying attention to what was going on. But what my team did is we watched Psy Seatbelt Psychic again, over and over again. We turned off the, the, the sound. And what we did is we just stopped every few seconds and we could see anything out of the, out of the window in the background. So we would screenshot what was happening in the background. And what we were able to do is we were able to put together that Thomas John uh, left, there was two shooting locations. One was at um, a ho hotel. And we know that because we could see the car drive out, always making the same route and going through the same neighborhoods and going past the same businesses and always in the right lane and always making right turns and just a loop, some giant loop and, and going through it several times because we can see, you know, the same businesses passing behind in the window as they go through. And then we know there was another location at uh, near a, um, a Kaiser hospital because we can see the Kaiser hospital in, in LA in the background. And it's always in the same spot. They're picking up the people at the same location and doing the same route, always in the right lane, always making a right turn. And you could see that with every person in the episodes. And we watched all these episodes, just pausing every few seconds, you know, to screenshot what's happening in the background. And then you can map it out. So, and oh, and the location where they drop them off also are two, the same location. So you could see that because as they get out of the car, you can see around them. You can see the, it's enough that if you watch it and you're looking for it, you can put it together. So these are people coming from a place that they were told to meet. They filled out applications and, and information and signed documents beforehand. Plus, we also found out, ready for this, that when you watch Seatbelt Psychic, at the very end, there is a credit sequence. Now, the only person who's supposed to be on the cast is Thomas John. Now, why is there a casting director and a casting assistant and a casting associate and casting? There's like eight people associated to casting listed on the on the um, credits of the show. And then if you go to IMDb for Seatbelt Psychic, there are people listed as cast. Now, why would there be people listed as cast members if he's the only person on the show? And if you look at those cast personalities, you know, they, they're listed on there and you click on it, you will see they correspond with people that you see on the show. So these are actors. Now, I don't think the actors knew they were going to be um, read. I don't think they were acting. I think they just did a hot read on the person, came up with some information, put them in the backseat of the car, and then just read, he just read them like he does. And then... They just happen to be people who had IMDb profiles themselves with photos and social media that was open. So these were not strangers walking up. These were people who had signed documents who had either applied or they'd been hired and they somebody did hot reading on them. It's really not the hard at all. Did you notice anything else in the um, the videos that you're, I mean, if you're watching them screen by screen, what anything else pop out? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he did a show right after Seatbelt Psychic, after my, uh, the Operation, Gre uh, Operation Pizza Roll came out. He did another show called The Thomas John Experience, which was almost the same thing as Seatbelt Psychic, with the addition that sometimes he gets out of the car and goes into like a hockey rink and talks to people or, you know, he stops and talks to people and, and reads their 
dead family members. They were all arranged ahead of time. But um, in that show, the Thomas John experience, there is a brief moment where Thomas John, uh, the, the editors of the show, show the cameras in the car. And these big hanging cameras, they show them. And they're like hanging here and hanging there. There's no, <laughs> there's no way you could have gotten in that car and not been like, oh my God, what am I got myself into? What are all these cameras face, facing me? Without saying something or reacting to it. So these, so that was one thing we noticed is that there's no way you could have hidden these. These cameras were not hidden. They were in perfect view. The, oh, we noticed that the shows were edited in a way, like when you're watching the video and you see him go through a uh, pass to something, right? There's camera going past something in the background. And then he's having a conversation with the person. And just like you're filming here, there's a camera here and there's a camera here and the cameras are always running. So when you see it, when it's edited, you see the person, you see Thomas John talking to the, and the, and the camera's just filled with his face. And then you see a camera, uh, and then you can hear the voice in the background but you don't see them. So what was happening is the, the show was being edited because you could see in the background him going through a tunnel or, or something that was, that was distinctive. And then seconds later, you would see the same tunnel and the conversations continuing. But in, in reality, they couldn't have happened oh. because the tunnel he wouldn't have been going through that same tunnel seconds later because it was like he's going through a tunnel and there's a distinctive like mark on it, vandalism or something like that. You know, something that was not a fixture of the tunnel with a tree right at the side. It was obvious that he was going through the tunnel more than once, but yet the conversation looked like there was no time spent. Like so they made talking. a con I get you. They made a continuity error. It's almost yeah, like and he's, we found multiple of those. It's almost like he's reading them, and the clock says four o two, and the conversation continues, and now it says three fifty eight. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or the or glass like is this, half full, this, and then it's empty, and then it's it's all. Yeah, it, it was multiple of those, and, wow. and it was just it was you could tell that because the way the conversation was, the camera would be on a person, and like it's full on Thomas John, and then the and then you hear the voice in the background. Well, it didn't mean that the the voice from the back seat was happening at the same time as the as the camera was on Thomas John. They just added that in. Well, it, that's very curious to me because those, that's a huge mistake for a big show to make a continuity. I mean, it happens all that. the time. It happens all the time. But for something <laughs> like that, it's just interesting. I mean, it's kind of odd. People, people did not. Nobody was going to take the trouble like my team did. I, it was horrible to watch these videos over and over and to screenshot them every few seconds. Nobody's going to take that kind of trouble. I mean, it was just obvious that when you get into the car, you put the seatbelt on and nobody reacts to the cameras around him, or he's, he's obviously not asking directions. I mean, it's just the basics. Just, there was no, once you start questioning this and you start saying to yourself, well, yeah, well then it's obvious. Just look on IMDb. And like I said, on the casting at the end, why would there be a casting? People don't ask these questions. They want to believe so badly that there's, they don't want to be challenged that way. Well, they it, it they is, just want to believe. Or it is also entertainment, this so-called reality show. Oh, but I don't call it entertainment. No, I, I understand. Mean, some I people might say it's entertainment, but it's not entertaining to see these people, ex their grief exploited the way it was. I mean, they're crying and, and he's, he's, he's telling them things that make decisions about their lives. Like he's telling them things like, you know, should you move? Should you not move? Should you reconcile with this person who's, who's always been uh, abusive to you? Should you forgive this person? You know, he's giving them um, advice that they're saying they're going to take when he doesn't know anything about it. He's not a therapist. He's not, he doesn't know the whole story. He's just doing it for TV. Actually, you're, so you're, it, it's abusive to these people and they don't know they're being abused. You're, you're segueing into something that I wanted to ask you about, which is perfect timing here. You must be psychic. Um, I must be psychic. So your New York Times article hit big a couple of years ago. Then yeah. the pandemic hit, which, by the way, no psychic saw coming, except in the most general terms. Not a single one saw it. Except in the most general terms. But um, <laughs> the New York Times subsequently and other news shows and whatnot, there's much more sympathetic to this kind of thing. And I think one of the New York Times articles I read recently, they were almost calling 
mediums as like the poor man's armchair therapist. I mean, it was, it was disturbingly sympathetic. Uh, yes. And you're mentioning, you know, they're not trained therapists. And what, so what do you, what's your reaction uh, when you see that kind of thing? Do you reach out to the people and try and hip them to all the harm that's done? Or what do you think about that? Well, it wouldn't take much of a Google search for somebody to be able to find a, a real journalist who's really trying to do investigative work uh, about what is the harm of the psychic. I mean, we've be, made it very clear in the skeptic community to uh, get articles and videos and things out there to to the media if they want to find them. And some do. Some some really get it. But some, some uh, journalists want to do a feel-good story. Or they report, I think the article you're talking about kind of took it like, um, in, in the comments, if you read that article, they were lambasted about, you know, the, the journalist was like, how dare you? What are you doing? This is wrong. And I think their response was more like, well, we were just reporting on what psychics are doing, how business is up, and it's just a business, and it's an occupation, and here's their experience with it. It's harmful. It's extremely harmful. These During the pandemic, there's a lot of lonely people out there, a lot, and they're and they're living in stressful times. They don't know what to expect, and people are vulnerable. And if you're put into one of these vulnerable situations where you have a health scare, or you're worried about your family members, or you're alone and you don't know if you'll ever find love, or whatever it is, it's cheap. It seems to be cheap to just have somebody to talk to and pay somebody, you know, relatively a small amount of money. Speaking of the pandemic, I mean, you're out in California. I'm here in Massachusetts. We're on Zoom. We have met live before. I like to do these live. I set a bunch up um, all at once when we're at a conference or something so I can see people in real life. Um, the pandemics has changed all that, but it's also changed stuff for the mediums, right? So they've moved on to Zoom as well. Has your team moved on to Zoom as well? And can you give me a little brief synopsis of some of that? I mean, I would think that, you know, you can't do a live show with 500 people in, a, in an auditorium anymore, but you can do a Zoom event. Oh, yes. They are making money hand over fist. Uh, we've called it Operation Lemon Meringue, and I've written a bunch of articles about this already. The psychics, the so-called psychics, have moved to Zoom. It's not an effort at all. In fact, it's made their job so much easier. And I don't even know if they're going to need to go back to the live stuff in the future. Because on Zoom, you've got, you know, two, 300 people on the Zoom call. Their names are underneath the, um, on the Zoom screen, as mine is and as yours is. And a quick Google of somebody who's got an unusual name. And you're on their Facebook page. You look at their Facebook page, maybe do some little more, maybe follow some leads, Google their name and come up with an obituary or something like that. And it doesn't have to be the psychic, the so-called psychic. It could be their, their assistant who's doing this in the background. And then, so the, here's your psychic person doing this reading to the person they're talking to. And in the background, there is a phone message or, or on messenger that's coming in to the psychic and it tells them your next person is somebody named Eric or Brian Kirby, and he lives in Massachusetts. And so then the psychic does their thing and says, I'm getting somebody whose name BK, BK. And the people in the audience, these 300 people or whatever, are all like, BK, that could be my grandfather, or that could be this, or it could be this. The psychic knows where they're going to go. They're looking for a guy named Brian Kirby. Now, if but they're I playing it out. Could I push back on you and say, yeah, you're, that's sure. possible. That's a possible way to do it. But you're just surmising that. I mean, have you been able to get any evidence? Like, I'm looking at oh. you right now, and I can see that you might have a ring light or some kind of light because it's in your glasses. I mean, have you been able to do anything like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Because, yeah, because what our team does is we're attending these events at the same time, right? We're in the room at the Zoom event at the same time that these people are are on the screen. They don't know we're there because they're not psychic. Um, we're using fake names or, and we've got our camera turned off or whatever. Some of us do. And what we can do is when the psychic calls on somebody like a Brian Kirby, it's usually, it's always somebody with a, with a unusual name. And it's always somebody with a full name. Never. It's, it's never Brian's iPhone. It's always somebody <laughs> with a first and last name. It always is. And so, <laughs> for some reason, and then when he, when the psychic calls on that person, 
our team is Googling them at the same time. We're like, oh, okay, they're on to somebody named Brian Kirby. Oh, I see Brian Kirby lives in Massachusetts. You know, we're on another screen looking. I've got multiple screens too. So, so can a psychic. And you can, we're, we're reading it off. Oh, I bet you he's going to say Brian Kirby has a, uh, just came back, uh, had to cancel a trip to Greece. And then psychic says, oh, something about you. We're supposed to be going to Greece this year. We can see it too. If the psychic can find it, we can find it. So we've done that multiple times. And when they're talking to the person, we're, we're looking at the same information. It's not hard. It's In fact, it's so obvious that it's incredible that it's not clear to people. I really think that um, what the way my team, the Girl of Skeptics, are doing is the best way of doing it is, is to, to really get into it and, and look at the nitty gritty of it and then get screenshots and audio and everything you can to prove it and then present it to the people and say, I, I'm not going to use the word fraud. I'm not going to use the word cheating and lying. I'm not going to do that because in, in the case of these um, people who are hot reading, it appears that they're hot reading. I mean, they could say that they're actually getting the message from the world of spirit, whatever that is, but the spirit might be looking at the Facebook pages of these sitters and then repeating it to the medium and then the medium's repeating it like that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so there's always a way out. It's ridiculous, and, I know. And I like, an way, I like the way you just <laughs> phrased that, though. You do the investigation, you collect the data, and then you present it. And you say, here's probably a more likely way that this could right. be done. I mean, possibly a spirit is looking at Facebook and giving them the messages, but really what, what do you think this is more likely? And then yeah, people can look at the evidence and make up difficult. their own mind. Let me, let me wrap up with one question because again, you've led me right to where I want to be. Once you do one of these investigations and you have an article come out or a video come out, I guess you don't do videos, but um, write an article in Skeptical Inquirer or the New York Times, do you actually hear from any of the victims? I guess I'll call them victims, or they consider themselves sitters. Do you hear from any of the sitters that maybe have read your article and say, hey, wait a minute, this is all starting to click with me. So you have heard yes. some, tell me. Oh, yes. I'll, oh, yeah, probably every few weeks. Well, when an article comes out, I usually hear from several people. No kidding, and, okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. People will say, um, I mean, I, I've told a few of their stories in some of the articles, but a lot of them I'm just holding back because I'm waiting for for the time where I can release what I know and and have these people on camera and say, I had a reading with this person and this and here's what happened to me and I've been emotionally distressed. So I don't really want to report on those stories because I don't want to out those people. And plus, a lot of them have been really harmed and they're telling me a lot of things in confidence. It's personal stuff and they feel really bad about falling for this. Um, I hear from people who say, you know, I was in a very low point in my life. I've just been, you know, I, my husband just died and here's this happening. Um, yeah. So I hear from people all the time that say, um, I've been going to this psychic for a long time, Thomas John, you know, or my sister recommended him. He, you know, she thought he was great. And then he starts telling me something that was just ridiculous. We found uh, it was right on my Facebook page. I had, I'll give you a quick example because he has, there's Yelp, Y-E-L-P, the, the, the website where people are, um, you know, talking about their experiences with a business or whatever. So in Thomas John's case, we follow his Yelp page and people are often putting up, you know, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. And I write to the person and they, sometimes they write back and we, we exchange um, the story. One woman told me just very recently that she'd had multiple readings with Thomas John. And she, she, she said that at one point he was saying something about a firefighter and that her son was a, or somebody was a firefighter. And she's like, no, that's not right at all. And he kept stressing that something, he's seeing something about wearing a fireman outfit and that he's a fireman or something like that. And she, after the call was over, she looked on her not her Facebook page, but her, I think like her daughter-in-law's Facebook page. And there was a picture of her son or her son-in-law wearing a fireman's outfit that he'd worn for a party. So it was, and it was very fresh on the Facebook page. You know, it was one of those more recent posts. And so she thinks that that's how he got the fireman thing because it was, 
on a Facebook page that was also open, linked to her own, that had a fireman's, uh, the guy wearing a fireman outfit. I had another woman tell me that um, Thomas John went on and on about a place, described this place where somebody in her family lives, it described uh, like a balcony and uh, the view and all these different things. And, and uh, Thomas John said, that's where your son lives or something like that. Turns out she went back and looked and found out that there was a picture of her son visiting somebody and that was, and he described it, but it was not where he lived. It was just someplace he was happened to be and took a picture at. So it's like, uh, <laughs> so these people have, have decided in their own mind that Thomas Tom is reading their Facebook pages. And then they reported that back to me. So whether, whether uh, there might be another um, reason for why he said that, it's not my business to know. It's just that that's what the person has said. I, this guy, no, I don't think so. No, I'm not going to him again. It was clear to me that he was repeating what was on my Facebook page. And they'll say, and there was other things that he said too that were obviously taken from my Facebook page. I think we're in a good spot here because again, you've led right into it. You must be something going I, I, on in your head here. <laughs> I, you know, but you know, you raise right at the end here. You've raised a very good point that these people are susceptible. They're vulnerable, and so they are being taken advantage of. And we also have to be cautious because we can all be vulnerable at times, and we can all be susceptible. So it's good that when they reach out to you, also lend back a sympathetic ear because you know you don't don't be too hard on yourself. Someone took advantage. Someone conned you, and that's a whole art in and of itself. Right. Yes. So I've uh, been there, done that. I was not raised a skeptic. I've been pretty gullible and. Uh, in my life. And I'm sure I will be conned out of something somewhere sometime because just you're in a hurry or you're vulnerable or whatever. So no. <laughs> well, you agreed to come on this show. <laughs> so I got you. That's fine. All right. Susan Gerbic, thank you so much for being here on 502 Conversations. I am Brian Kirby. Susan Gerbic, um, I, get, I can't call you a psychic investigator because that means something different, but investigator of psychics, that's a good word, sure. and science activist. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate coming on and doing an update.